Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, one of our uh, cardiology stars speak to us today. Um, we've had we've had him speak at Grand Rounds before, uh, which is so it's so it's great to have him back. Uh, uh, everybody knows Dr. Wiesenen uh, is uh, our director of uh, structural, what do you call it, structural heart disease and, interven and uh, interventional cardiology, or he's an interventional cardiologist. He went to the University of Minnesota for medical school, uh, that Mayo Clinic thing for internal medicine, and then Kentucky for cardiovascular disease. Been with us now, what is it, a couple, three years, two, two years? and uh, really doing a lot of neat things with uh, wires and catheters and stuff. So we're uh, just fortunate to have him, and well, let's welcome Dr. Wiesner. Thank you. When I define what I do for a living, it's usually with wires and catheters and things. And I kind of wave my hands a little bit, so. All right, well, thank you all for being here. It's a real honor to be back here. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to sort of uh, reminisce a little bit with you all about the first time I was here, which was two years ago, right after my uh, uh, hiring here at Erlanger. Um, so we're going to talk today a little bit about mitral valve disease and the update of mitral valve disease. And, and this uh, takes particular importance in light of some uh, recent publications that have come out that have really given this some new uh, momentum and fervor. So we're going to spend a little bit of time with, those, with that new data here yet today. Uh, as it relates to mitral valve disease, I have no disclosure other than I'm very passionate about it. Um, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time just talking about uh, what I was talking to you all last time I was here, which was talking about transcatheter aortic valve uh, repair, which is a replacement, which is uh, a program that we have started since I was here last time. So I was here in October of 2016 to give grand rounds. And we started talking about TAVR, but we hadn't actually started the program here yet, and so I'm going to give you an update on that today. But we're primarily going to focus on mitral regurgitation, the, the pathophysiology. We're going to try to understand the epidemiology a little bit. And then we're going to talk about not only medical and device-specific uh, treatments for mitral regurgitation, but we'll also highlight the uh, repair and replacement options for the optimal management of mitral regurgitation. So just again to get back to our discussion on transcatheter aortic valve replacements, uh, this is uh, what that is. You can see an aortic valve uh, being put into the annulus of a, of a stenotic aortic valve. This is the Edward Sapien system here. This is actually one of the older generation devices. But you can see there's a pacemaker coming in here. The heart is beating at 180 beats per minute. And then after deployment and the injection of contrast, you can see a new valve functioning in place of where the old, where old one was. Since we started our program in December of 2016, we have done now 95 cases here at Erlanger. Five of these have been valve and valve cases. Interestingly, our second ever patient was a, uh, a patient who we put a valve in her tricuspid position. We did that intentionally. Uh, so we put it in the tricuspid position for a torrential tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, we have had two pulmonic valve cases for patients with uh, congenital uh, problems with their pulmonic valves. We've had two aortic insufficiency cases. You can see our breakdown between the two uh, devices that are commercially available in the United States. But this is the most exciting thing right here. In the last uh, year, we've started to do uh, about half of our patients with conscious sedation. So now we're not even doing general anesthesia with a lot of these patients, and, and that makes their recovery times a lot easier. Uh, we've had one uh, that was a combination TAVR-TVAR and somebody who had a... Uh, had uh, uh, an ulcerated plaque within their uh, uh, arch of their aorta. And then we have done uh, five with uh, cerebral embolic protection, and there's going to be more on that down the road. So that's what's happened since I talked to you all last. Uh, we've been very busy on this front, but now what's exciting is where we're heading with mitral regurgitation. So when we talk about mitral regurgitation, we talk about what that really looks like and all the, <coughs> all the different uh, faces that... Um, takes on. So you can see on your left hand side of the screen here is a normal looking heart, your mitral valve sitting right here, so your left atria, your left ventricle, and as blood is passing from the atria into the ventricle, you see that there's no regurgitation going from the normal valve. However, over here on the right hand side of the screen, you can see that in fact there is some regurgitation here at the level of the mitral valve, so as blood is coming from the left atrium into the left ventricle, 
And as you're getting systolic contraction, rather than go it all going out the aortic valve, you have a portion of that blood flow going back into the left atrium from regurgitation. So what we see is that you have really um, uh, a couple of things as it relates to mitral regurgitation. I do want to just mention that mitral stenosis also falls within the update, but we're going to spend all of our time today talking primarily about mitral regurgitation just because there hasn't been a whole lot of progress made on mitral stenosis care in recent years. So when we talk about mitral regurgitation, we talk about primary and secondary causes of mitral regurgitation. So primary, the primary abnormality that we have with mitral regurgitation is that you, you can get uh, abnormality of the mitral tissues themselves. So this usually involves one or more components of the valvular apparatus, so that would include things like the leaflets or the chordae tendinae, the papillary muscles, even the annulus could be included in that. But then secondary causes of mitral regurgitation would be uh, things that we have previously called functional mitral regurgitation, and this is due to other cardiac conditions. So this is usually either ischemic heart disease or more, op more often a cardiomyopathic process, and we're going to spend a lot of time uh, looking at that in a little bit. So when we talk about primary causes of mitral regurgitation, we're talking a lot about uh, degenerative mitral valve disease, and the one that everybody thinks of is mitral valve prolapse. So my, myxomatous valve disease, uh, also known as myxomatous degeneration of the valve, um, it usually has uh, 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 redundancy of the anterior and or posterior leaflets of the mitral valve, plus minus the chordal apparati, <clears throat> and these are typically in younger patients. And so when we see uh, younger patients who have mitral valve disease, we typically refer to that as myxomatous mitral valve disease. When it's primarily in older patients, we think of that more as fibroelastic deficiencies. We think that there may be some continuum of the same disease process for these patients just manifesting later on in life, but more or less you can think of this as a primary abnormality of the valve itself. So the valve is deficient or d dysfunctional in some way, usually because of redundant tissue. Rheumatic valve disease is not something we see here very often, although I think we've had two cases of this lately uh, that have come to our attention. But rheumatic valve disease is something that we see typically more in the developing world. And so while, while degenerative mitral valve disease is the most prominent cause of uh, or is one of the more prominent causes of primary mitral regurgitation in the developed world, in the developing world it's still rheumatic valve disease. And, and, and then we think about other things, trauma, uh, so you can get rupture of papillary muscles and cords. Uh, um, you can get uh, uh, drug use. Uh, and we're not talking IV drug abuse. We're talking about other things such as ergotamines, bromocryptine, uh, pergolide, uh, the fen, -fen uh, which was actually discovered in my previous practice up in Fargo, North Dakota before I came here. Uh, so this is all thing, these are all things that have a primary effect on the valve itself and make the valve dysfunctional. And then we can also get into some congenital heart disease, which would include clefts of the mitral valve and mitral annular calcification, which can have an effect on whether or not it's stenotic or regurgitant. Whereas secondary mitral regurgitation, and we briefly talked about this, coronary artery disease, dilated cardiomyopathies, hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, and even right ventricular pacing. So what we often see is in coronary disease, we can see regional wall motions that distort the mitral valve apparatus, and that leads us to inadequate closure of the mitral uh, tissues. Uh, and then we can, see ad we can see subsequent to that, we can see uh, abnormal ventricular remodeling after uh, myocardial infarction, for, for instance. And so then we can see MR as a result of that. And sometimes the MR is worse immediately during the time of myocardial infarction, and subsequently will get better. But we'll talk a little bit about some of the data that shows what mitral regurgitation looks like in infarcted patients. But the dilated cardiomyopathies are really something that's gaining a lot of attention, a lot of focus right now, and, and, and that's with this publication I've alluded to and we'll talk about towards the end of the uh, presentation. But what you really see with LV systolic dysfunction is you see, a, you see papillary muscle displacement, you see tethering of the leaflet tissues, you see annular dilatation, and then in some cases you'll even see, especially if they've got dyssynchrony, LV dyssynchrony, that then makes the valve itself function a little bit abnormally. All right, let's get into a little bit of cocktail party trivia here. So these are things that are interesting statistics about where we are with mitral valve disease. If you look at a standard series of echocardiograms and you look to see who's got any sort of mitral regurgitation, up to 
of patients in a normal healthy patient population will have some element of mitral regurgitation. Now that's usually in the order of trace to mild. The vast majority will be trace to mild. We can even call that even a, a functional regurgitation from the standpoint of it's normal, we, it's physiologic, we expect it to happen. But if you look in the Framingham Heart Study, mild mitral regurgitation was, was present in up to 20% of patients. And then if you look in the Strong Heart Study, you had moderate disease in up to 2% of patients and severe in 0.2% of asymptomatic, otherwise quote unquote healthy patients. So this disease process exists and some instances has a very insidious presentation. Now, what we know about mitral valve prolapse, again, being the sort of primary thing that we think about when it comes to uh, mitral valve, uh, primary mitral valve regurgitation, is that mitral valve prolapse occurs in approximately 2 to 3 percent of the population, and up to 70 percent of those patients will have trace or mild mitral regurgitation. But in asymptomatic mitral valve prolapse patients, you'll see up to 4 percent of those patients will have severe disease. Going back and talking about uh, non-ST segment myocardial infarctions, within the seven days, again, looking at, uh, uh, this, was a, this was from a 300-patient uh, study that was published in, uh, in uh, European Heart Journal in 2006, 300 patients who underwent uh, transthoracic echo within a week of their myocardial infarction, and 42% of those patients had uh, at least uh, mild or more uh, mitral regurgitation with 63% of all those patients having mild, 20% with moderate, and 17% with severe. So you can see the severe category is starting to go up as we get into these disease processes. And then when you get into a cardiomyopathic process, you see that the uh, idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathies, up to 62% had either no or mild MR, but you had 38% of patients, 38% of patients had up to moderate or severe. So looking at that, at that classification or those, that, that epidemiologic uh, spread of patients, what are we looking at with regard to symptoms? Well, symptoms arise when you have some uh, LV systolic enlargement, you have LV systolic dysfunction, uh, you've got pulmonary hypertension or AFib. So the patients with an isolated mild or moderate primary MR, those patients are asymptomatic. And since there's little volume overload of the ventricle and the cardiohemodynamics are normal and the forward cardiac output is normal, these patients usually are asymptomatic. It's only when we start to see that there's volume overload uh, and, and the, left ventricular, the left ventricular size is enlarged or you get some systolic dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension as a result. And one, some patients will feel when they go into that atrial fibrillation and that loss of that atrial kick for a lot of patients makes them symptomatic. And so that's when we see patients start to feel pretty terrible. So this usually presents itself as dyspnea on exertion, fatigue, atrial fibrillation, which may or may not be felt. Uh, the symptoms that also come along with heart failure from pulmonary congestion, edema, chest pressure, and those kinds of things. And exertional dyspnea and fatigue are due to the combination of that decreased forward flow, essentially a decrease in your effective cardiac output, and it increases that left atrial pressure. So now you've got an increase in your left atrial pressure because of that black backflow going into the left atrium from the left ventricle, and then that leads to left atrial dilatation and, and, and then pressure build up into the pulmonary venous and arterial circulation as a result. We, we see that patients with severe MR uh, go on to develop a lot of these heart failure symptoms and that, uh, that we can stage their heart failure based on where they are with not only their ejection fraction but the size of their LV cavities as well. So when the, when the MR comes on from secondary uh, 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 causes, so a dilated LV and such, a lot of these patients are already usually a little symptomatic from their dilated cardiomyopathic process. But what's often interesting is that patients can be relatively asymptomatic and then go exercise. And as they're exercising, to suddenly develop worsening of their mitral regurgitation, which develops as a, as a transient elevation in their left atrial pressures. And so exercise tolerance becomes a big issue. As a matter of fact, Dr. Few and I are sharing a couple of patients like that right now who are pretty stable as far as if they just sit around and don't do anything. But as soon as they start to exercise, they feel pretty terrible. So how do we make this diagnosis of MR? 
Well, I think we could probably all safely say that we could get an echo, we could get an echo, and we could get an echo. There are other ways of doing this. Cath is a, a means of doing this, uh, whether that's with a left ventricular uh, 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 angiogram, so a ventricular gram, or if we do cardiac MRI or uh, pressure monitoring with a right heart catheterization, and then stress testing also sometimes will bring out the patients that I just mentioned where if they have mild regurgitation but they're very symptomatic and you exercise them, you can see the worsening of their regurgitation. And then serial assessments, and, and we won't get into it today, but there are ways in which we monitor these patients over time if they have a certain level of regurgitant disease. And the frequency with which we monitor these patients is actually prescribed to us in the ACC guidelines. And so, so there are serial tests that can be done, and as we're watching patients echocardiographically over time, we're looking to see is their ventricular status worsening? Is their ventricular functioning getting worse? Is their LV dilating to any degree? And if we start to see those and we put it in combination with symptoms, then we think about earlier interventions for these patients. So getting back to <clears throat> medical therapy for primary mitral valve disease. So again, this is a dysfunctional mitral valve whether it's redundant tissues or cortical disruption or whatever the case may be, symptomatic therapy. So the best data that exists is that we don't have great data. So medical therapy for mitral regurgitant disease, for, for primary mitral valve disease, is a little sketchy. The best data that we have perhaps suggests that beta blockers, which can reverse some of the LV dysfunction in experimental models of mitral regurgitation, uh, is somewhat beneficial. So we see that uh, patients who receive beta blockers maybe have uh, better surgical outcomes, or at least we can maybe delay the onset to when they need to have a surgical intervention. But by and large, we can think about heart failure therapies, but only really when patients are having symptoms, when they're actually having heart failure, when their LV systolic just goes down. So we can treat hypertension, we can treat with ACE inhibitors, or we can treat with some diuretics, but in the asymptomatic normal EF, those kinds of patients, the medical therapy is really kind of all over the place, and so there's a lot of discretion as far as what it is that we use. But once you develop symptoms, really then that's where, because we don't have good medical therapies, we think about progressing on to surgical therapies. So the traditional fix for somebody with <clears throat> a mitral regurgitant primary mitral valve problem is a standard sternotomy open heart approach and as clean and nice as that really looks, this is actually what that usually looks like. It's a bit of a mess. <clears throat> but in the right hands with the right surgeons, you can get a tremendous fix and a good long-term outcome. And now what's exciting is that we can start doing these with a minimally invasive approach through a thoracotomy. So now patients don't even necessarily have to have the standard sternotomy to get their mitral valve fixed. They can actually get this through many incisions. And while those are not less painful, the recovery time is certainly much quicker and patients get a good durable repair. So at the end of the day, when we look at the fixing of surgical, uh, surgical disease for mitral regurgitation, what we're really looking at is you need a surgeon who can give you a good repair. And the way we define that in the cardiac community is to say if our surgeons can do a repair 90% of the time, then that's the sign of a good cardiac surgeon. And if they're only replacing the valve 10% of the time, then great news. But the more that they replace that valve, the more likely that, val that ventricle is going to become dysfunctional on down the road. And so the preference is to try to work towards mitral repairs, less so for mitral replacements. And that way you, you obviate the need for any problems with anticoagulation and, and those kinds of things on down the road. When we look at and sorry, this slide is a little, little small to read, but when we look at the ACC guidelines, and these came out in 2014 with an update in 2017 that didn't give us much update on mitral regurgitation, but when we look at uh, the indications for surgery for primary mitral regurgitation, again, it's recommended for symptomatic patients with chronic or severe primary mitral regurgitation whose ejection fractions are above 30%. It is recommended in the asymptomatic patients with chronic severe primary mitral regurgitation and LV dysfunction. So that's defined as your EF is less than 60%, but between that 30 to 60% range. And if your left ventricular end, end systolic dimension 
is more than 40 millimeters. So that puts you in a stage C heart failure classification. That gets a, a level of uh, uh, a recommendation of one level of evidence B. Mitral repair is recommended in preference over mitral valve replacement when the surgical treatment is indicated for patients with that. And then we look at mitral repair is recommended in preference over a surgical replacement in the treatment, when the treatment is indicated for patients with chronic severe primary MR involving the anterior leaflet or both leaflets when a successful and durable repair is accomplished. So you can see the ACC is very heavily emphasizing the need for a good surgical repair when you can get a repair done. And then, of course, if you can do it in combination with other things. I'm not going to get into this slide, but you can see that there are other issues with, you know, when do you take patients who are asymptomatic, and if you're not going to, uh, if you're taking them to the operating room for other reasons other than their mitral regurgitation. And then you can see down here, again, 2014, transcatheter therapies may be considered for severely symptomatic patients with chronic severe primary mitral regurgitation who have a reasonable life expectancy but prohibitive surgical risk. And we'll get into that. So, segue, what if your patients are too high risk for surgery? What happens then? Well, you know, the surgeons would tell you there's nobody that's too high risk except for the ones that they don't operate on. And that ends up actually being quite a few number of patients. And so what has happened in the last several years and commercially available since 2015 is this little device here called the MitraClip. So I'm going to just show you <clears throat> this picture here to explain what the anatomy of the clip looks like, and then I'm going to show you a quick video. So this is the clip itself. This is a cobalt chromium uh, device that is under a polyester mesh, and what you can see here are these little spikes, and these little spike things here are connected to this wire. This wire, when it's pulled back, this, the, the clip, the, the grippers lift up, and then you can slide your mitral valve leaflets into this area, this area, and you can drop your grippers down and you can grasp onto that mitral valve and then you can put it together in a similar way to what Alfieri described. So here is this video about how this procedure occurs. So again, here's your mitral regurgitation and this is what this device looks like. You can imagine during uh, surgical procedures, they have a lot of equipment. This is my one piece of equipment. It looks pretty cumbersome and, and gnarly. We do a transeptal puncture across the, going from the right atrium to the left atrium. And this right here is a 24 French device. So we're putting a very large hole across the interatrial septum, which amazingly most patients tolerate pretty reasonably well. Once we get this catheter then in and across the interatrial septum, we can bring the clip in and the clip delivery system itself has a lot of moving parts to it. So we can move it in the anterior and posterior directions. We can move it laterally and medially. We can rotate it in a number of different planes so that we can line up our clip exactly with where our pathology really lies. So we do this under transesophageal echocardiographic guidance. So you can see we're rotating the clip here, make sure we've got it aligned. We turn on color and we have one of our CV anesthesiologists who's doing this live while we're getting the pictures or while we're putting the clip in. And then we can see exactly where we want this device to go. So you can see the grippers are up, we're pulling back, we put our grippers down, we cinch everything together, and then we can tie it down if we like it. If we don't like it, we can take it out, we can reapply, put it into a different position, come back, re-grasp the leaflets, cinch it down, and then see if we can get a better result. Now, you'll never see complete elimination of mitral regurgitation, ever. But again, a number of people can live with trivial, mild, or even a certain degree moderate mitral regurgitation. So what we're looking to do with these patients, our goals of care are really, can we reduce the amount of mitral regurgitation to the point where they can live with it? To the point where they feel better and are gonna have a good long-term durable result with that as a result of this. Now what's interesting is you see this clip in place and you just saw a little bit ago that that results in a, what, what we refer to now as a double orifice valve. But this is predicated on the, on the notion of the Alfieri stitch, which is what Dr. Alfieri put together a number of years ago to talk about how we could uh, placate the anterior and posterior leaflets of the mitral valve together to get rid of the mitral regurgitation. This is not what I'm trying to do, however. This is not the goal of a mitroclip therapy is to put my surgeon out of business, although this would be a lot of fun. <clears throat> he, no, I, I kid. He's, he, uh, 
this is this is part of the armamentarium for us to be able to provide a, a full spectrum of service to our patients with mitral valve disease at any stage of their life. And so looking at what this typically looks like is, you know, if you've got somebody who's got severe mitral regurgitation, so in this standard transthoracic picture where you have a standard four-chamber view with your left ventricle here, your right ventricle over here, your right atrium here, your left atrium here, this is your mitral valve, and you can see this blush of color that comes across this way is abnormal. So this is that patient with mitral regurgitation, and you can tell that because it's very, uh, 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 sort of, it's not a central jet, it's very eccentric in nature, that this is more likely because of myxomatous valve disease, that this is because of redundant tissue of this valve. And so what you can see here in a standard transesophageal echocardiogram is the same picture. This is the left atrium up top and the left ventricle down below. And you can see how much flow, that color that's coming back is the abnormal blood flow from mitral regurgitation. One of the great things that's happened as a result of the MitraClip procedure and others like it in the cath lab is it has really forced us to become better imagers. And so as a result of that, many of us in the field who do sort of structural heart disease as our primary focus have also gotten uh, boarded in echocardiography and we spend a lot of time doing echo imaging as much as we do fluoroscopy. And what you can see is the 3D imaging has really improved a lot along the way. Now it's got limited utility, but we do use 3D imaging on a very regular basis, again, to help direct our therapies and see where it is that we need to go. So this is the kind of patient that we're looking at, patients who have this kind of disease process, and patients in, in, in my world who are usually too sick or relatively contraindicated from a standard open heart surgery. So when we look at where this came from, back in 2011, this was the landmark paper that really set this technology on the map. And so from 2005 until 2009, they were enrolling patients in the trial called the Everest trial. And this Everest trial was randomizing patients in a two-to-one fashion, oh goodness, randomizing patients in a two-to-one fashion to uh, surgery versus a mitra clip. And so they had to have patients who had severe, which is three or four plus mitral regurgitation, and they had uh, that randomization uh, uh, based on what their anatomy looked like and whether a clip they thought could be applied. And what you can see from that data was that the primary efficacy endpoint of freedom from death or surgery for mitral valve dysfunction, once you got a year out, didn't actually look all that favorably uh, for our patients. And so what you can see is that the surgery patients tended to do a little bit better than the uh, percutaneous repair patients. But you can see that the adverse event rates were actually in favor of the mitra clip. And so because of that, what we said was, well, it looks like at a year out, these patients do reasonably well. It's a good alternative for patients who are at a prohibitive risk for surgery. And so that makes it look like maybe we can go forward with this. Well, when you look at some of the disease uh, uh, process or the residual disease at a year out, again, what you see is that, sure, we had improvements in mild disease and mild to moderate disease, but it certainly does look better than surgery. So what I always tell my patients is when you're coming to get a mitral clip from me, if I could get you to surgery, I would. Surgery is still better at the end of the day than what we were seeing in this paper from 2011. Now, I'll, I'll grant you the technology has improved, the techniques have improved, and so the numbers now today look a little bit better than this, but we can get reasonable repairs, but it's still not as good as surgery. So if you can get surgery for your primary mitral regurgitant disease, that still is the preferred approach. And when you look at the subgroup analysis, looking at who's better set for a mitral repair versus a percutaneous approach, well, surgery still looks like the winner in a lot of these, especially if you've got a normal ejection fraction, if it is a degenerative, or in this case, a primary mitral regurgitant disease, if you're a younger, healthier person, uh, those patients are the ones who seem to do better with surgery. But look at this, this is interesting. If your EF is abnormal, if you've got more functional disease, or if you're older, well, maybe it's a wash. Maybe those patients do just as well with other therapies. Well, when you look at the four-year uh, data that came out, and this was published, I believe, in uh, 2013, and the four-year data go on to show us that, you know, again, at one year out, you had a, you had a higher incidence of patients who needed 
uh, to go back for uh, surgery for various reasons or they had significant residual regurgitation. But if you look out at four years, those numbers actually come a little bit closer together and this p-value is no longer st statistically significant. There's no difference in death either at one year or at four years. And then the reoperative rates were still higher for the percutaneous group. But when you look at the residual amount of three or four plus MR at that four year mark, you can see that the rates are relatively the same. And this is, this is really where, where we're all interested in. This is what, the, what I, I think really matters in all of this is if you look at these patients in regard to whether or not they got the <clears throat> mitral clip device or they got a standard surgery, they all started off with three or four plus mitral regurgitation and they all had some improvement at one year, but you can see the mild at the one plus or zero was a lot less in the mitral clip group than it was in the surgical group. But if you look out at four years, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, so, if you, so again, looking out at four years, again, the, the surgical group did better. But if you look at the New York Heart Association classification, you could get people down to a New York Heart Association classification, one or two heart failure with the device, and that actually looked the same both at a year and at four years out as compared to surgery. So symptomatically, we seem to be making a difference in these patients. And so when you look at patients whose life expectancy isn't going to be 10 years out possibly, maybe it's because they're 75 years old and they've got bad coronary disease and they're end stage renal disease and they're diabetic and they're horribly controlled or whatever the case may be. But if they don't have a great long-term prognosis, you're looking for a couple of years, maybe three or four years, you're looking for some palliative therapy, you're, you've got somebody who's had maybe some radiation to the chest, you've had a previous sternotomy or whatever, this may be a very reasonable option for those patients. And so again, looking at four years out in the subgroup analysis, again, the degeneratives do better with surgery and the younger patients do better with surgery, but we still have a good option, a reasonable option that's safe and effective for these, for these older or sicker patients. So let me give you a case. A 73-year-old man comes in, he's got, uh, he's got uh, four plus severe mitral regurgitation, he's got New York Heart Association class three symptoms, but he's also got severe COPD, diabetes, paroxysmal AFib, he's got chronic kidney disease, and his STS, which is the, the model that we use to calculate surgical risk, his risk of undergoing a cardiac operation and dying from that surgery is 8.3%. So this is, the, this is the tool that we use to judge not only in the TAVR world, but in the mitral world as well. And we look to see what's the risk of that patient undergoing surgery. And I'll tell you, this is half of the equation. The other half of the equation, if I would put it in front of you, is this guy looked like a hot pile of garbage. Looked like he probably was too sick for a haircut. So in that case, if somebody is too sick for those things and they don't pass the eyeball test and they're looking kind of questionable on paper, well, maybe there's still something we can do to help these people, people out. So we had our surgeons get together. We had our heart failure specialists get together. And we all decided that surgery wasn't a good idea for this patient. My surgeon at, that, uh, at my practice, uh, this was up in North Dakota, my surgeon, uh, was, she was a fantastic surgeon, but she didn't do thoracotomy. She did primary sternotomies, and we just didn't think this patient was going to survive the sternotomy. So we said, well, okay, let's, let's plan on this, uh, on this repair uh, with a, a, a mitra clip. So again, this, these are the pictures that I was showing you earlier. We've got the severe regurgitation right here, and you can see what it looks like in the TEE. So this is what this looks like in real time. So this is while we're doing the procedure. You can actually see I'm coming with my device from the right atrium across the interatrial septum into the left atrium, and I'm bringing my device down now across the mitral valve. And you can see that as we're looking at this on the 3D view down here in the lower right-hand corner, this is what we refer to as the surgeon's view. So this is as the surgeons are looking at that mitral valve from the atrium down into the ventricle. This is the way they look at it. And so we try to do our clip alignment we want the, the clips to be perpendicular with the, the, the leaflets themselves, and so we try to get that sort of straight up and down appearance in our 3D images. And then what we do is we bring that clip down across the valve, and we can place it using our color imaging and make sure that we're happy with its position. So you can see we're down across the valve. Here's the aortic valve here. We're in the left ventricle with the clip. You can see now I've pulled the clip up and I've dropped my grippers excuse me, drop my grippers down here, and now you can see, see how that, those leaflets kind of look like they're being pulled into the device itself. 
Well, now that I've got that pulled in, I can cinch that down. And this is certainly a lot better result than what this patient started with. So now I can decide, is this good enough? Am I happy with it? Do I let it go? Do I change positions? Do I go somewhere else? Do I put a second clip in? All of these questions are, are things that you have to answer at the time. And this is what it looks like under fluoroscopy. So you can see this big 26 French sheath comes up and across the interatrial septum. You can see we've got the, the leaflets uh, grasped. You can see now as I'm, uh, I've released the clip, but my delivery system is still in the left atrium. And then once I pull my delivery system out and the clip is in place, that that's what that looks like. So here's what the final result looks like. So this is that single clip. This is the residual leak that we have. So that arguably looks tremendously better. So this patient had a substantial reduction down to one plus from a four plus MR. You can see that on 3D, now your mitral valve doesn't quite look normal, but it's that double orifice, or as I like to say, the bow tie appearance, to the mitral orifice here. You've got your clip in the middle, and now this is your standard transthoracic image. You see that there's this funny little bright thing sitting on the tip of the mitral valve, and you can see very little regurgitation as a result. And so this patient does well. This patient stays in the hospital one day. So just stays overnight after the procedure, goes home the very next day, didn't stay in the ICU, went through cardiac rehab and did very well. So these are the types of patients that can substantially benefit from these types of procedures. Now, if we take a, a look at secondary mitral regurgitation and how it applies to our care for these patients, this is where this gets a little bit murkier. So we know that secondary mitral regurgitation, again, comes from systolic dysfunction, coronary disease, and the like. So the treatment, the medical therapy, is the same as what we would recommend for coronary disease, for heart failure treatment, and that is beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, aldosterone antagonists, uh, cr uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy in those patients who need it. Again, we talked about that desynchrony oftentimes can lead to dysfunction of the mitral valve, and there's actually good evidence to say that if patients do have a left bundle branch block, if they've got a LV systolic dysfunction, you can oftentimes not only improve the remodeling of the LV, but you can substantially improve their mitral regurgitation. And so for a lot of these patients who uh, have been in trials to look at this question of does the clip help in, or in, in secondary mitral regurgitation, a lot of those patients were kicked out of the trials early on because they ended up going and getting uh, uh, a LV lead placed for their pacemaker, or they ended up getting some sort of a biventricular system to help with their mitral regurgitation. So a lot of these patients benefit from that and have subsequent improvement in their mitral valve disease. Coronary revascularization is also important in these patients. And then we talk about the interventions. So going back to the guidelines, so surgery is reasonable in chronic severe secondary MR, stages C and D, in patients who are already undergoing surgery for the reason. However, when you look at surgery for severely symptomatic patients by itself with chronic severe secondary MR, that's a, a, a recommendation of 2B from the guidelines with a level of evidence B. So not that really robust, oh, let's go get it kind of uh, recommendation that you'd like to, you'd like to see. And then mitral repair may be considered for these patients with chronic moderate secondary MR who are undergoing other cardiac surgical procedures. And interestingly, I'm not going to get into this today, but interestingly, one of the things that we found is that perhaps in these chronic ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathies with bad mitral regurgitation, repair isn't actually what you want because the, the re- the, the, the leak rates or the, re, uh, uh, the, the, the residual regurgitation that happens at a year out with a repair for these valves is actually relatively high. And so the recommendation is to do a valve replacement with cordal sparing technique. So, so the recommendation in these subset of patients, which if you think about it, how many heart failure patients do we have? How many people have dilated LVs? And how many people do we look at and say, gee, that mitral regurgitation is in the moderate or worse range? but it's there because they've got bad LVs. Well, that's this population we're talking about. And so you can see this is a very busy slide, but if we come all the way over here to secondary MR, we have our coronary therapies, our heart failure therapies, consider cardiac resynchronization therapy with a biventricular system. And if they're severe symptomatic and they've got 
persistent New York heart class three or four symptoms, you level of 2B, you could go to surgery. But if either they're asymptomatic or they have, they're, they're, they're in the progressive stages, you can continue to monitor these patients because why? We don't have good therapy. We don't have good proven evidence that anything we do up to this point has made any substantial benefit. So case in point, 77-year-old man, he actually came to uh, the hospital, this was just this past January, EF of 20 to 25 percent. He had terrible coronary disease and as a result had terrible mitral regurgitation, we thought. He was a very high risk, again a guy who looked like he was almost too sick for a haircut. So we ended up stenting his coronaries. Now he needed support because of the degree of his coronary disease, so we did it on ECMO. We placed percutaneous ECMO cannulae, we did his PCI, kept him safe during the procedure, we were able to take him off ECMO right away, and then we followed him. And we followed him for a month out, and we followed him for two months out, and despite coronary uh, revascularization and despite optimization of his medical therapy, he still persisted with severe mitral regurgitation. So this is this patient. This is his TEE. So this is his left atrium here, the left ventricle down here. This is his mitral valve. And what I want to try to impress upon you is, you see how these leaflets really are not coming back together? They're almost being tethered down. Well, that's because of that displacement of the papillary muscles because of that LV dilation. That, those papillary muscles are pulling those cords down, pulling that mitral valve down, and now that valve is just not able to coapt. And so this is where you typically will see a big central jet of regurgitation that falls into the range of the secondary mitral regurgitation. So back in August, we had a trial that was presented at uh, the European Society for Cardiology. And this was a big downer. This, this really was a sad story. This was the Mitra FR, which all of the study, all of the study was done in France. Uh, and they were treating a number of patients for this exact problem. So they had patients, they had uh, enrolled 452 patients. They ultimately randomized 152 into each arm. And what they did is they said, you know, we're going to just do goal-directed medical therapy if you, if you randomize into the medical arm, and we're going to put a clip on you if you get randomized into the procedure arm again, because we've never been able to prove that surgery is of any benefit in these patients or a substantial benefit in these patients. And so they had 152 in the device group, 152 in the uh, medical therapy group, and dud. It was a dud. So complication rates were somewhat high. So they had a device implantation failure rate of 4%. They had um, cardiogenic shock in almost 3% of these patients, and an overall complication rate of about 15% which that's relatively unacceptably high. Uh, serious adverse events out to one year in the device group versus the control group again, a little bit higher in the clip group versus the medical therapy group. The number of patients who went on to transplantation or get an LVAD was statistically the same between two groups. And then you can see ischemic or hemorrhagic strokes were higher in the device group and, and, uh, and then uh, need to go on for renal replacement therapy was higher in the device group. So this was kind of a bummer. We, we had held out some hope that this was going to be a good positive study, and it wasn't. Uh, and if you look, there was no improvement in death, either from any cause or from cardiovascular death, and then unplanned f hospitalization for heart failure remained unchanged. And the, the adverse events were, again, numerically higher in the device group than they were in the uh, uh, medical therapy group. And when you look at freedom of uh, an event from when the device was implanted or when the randomization occurred, you can see that there was really no difference. And so, again, this was, this was disheartening. And so we all kind of prayed and kept fingers crossed and legs crossed that this, uh, this uh, earlier this month, that we would see something different with this trial called the COAP trial. And I was very fortunate to be able to enroll about three patients into this trial. Uh, this was a really difficult trial to run. This was a little bit more um, goal-directed medical therapy. They actually had to have heart failure specialists involved with the management of these patients to get them enrolled into the trial. This actually was double the size of the Mitra FR study. So we had 302 patients randomized to Mitra Clip plus goal-directed therapy, and we had 312 patients randomized to goal-directed medical therapy alone. Now, you can imagine if you're coming to your doctor and you're panting like a dog and you feel terrible and your doctor says,
let's flip a coin and see what we're going to do. Oh, tails, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing and optimize your medicine. You're going to be one unhappy camper. And so this trial was very hard to enroll in as a result of that. Very slow enrollment, took a long time to get there, but you can see what we were looking at with the effectiveness was heart failure hospitalizations through two years, and then we were also looking at safety, freedom from device-related complications through 12 months. This is a much different study. So if you look at the heart failure hospitalizations in the medical therapy group versus the device therapy group, this is 68% rehospitalization at two years as compared to 36% in the device group, or a number needed to treat of three. What? If you look at freedom from death, medical therapy, 46%. Device therapy, 29%. Statistically significant number needed to treat of six. Mic drop. What? So if you look at our complication rates, wait a minute very low complication rates with this device. What happened? What, what made the big difference? Well, if you look at these two studies, we actually, in the American uh, grading system, uh, in the US, we went with a higher uh, effective regurgitant orifice area of 30 millimeters squared versus what they went by with 20. We actually had sicker patients with uh, um, uh, higher, um, I'm sorry, uh, um, uh, uh, we went with sicker patients who had, uh, this slide doesn't have it, but sicker patients who had more uh, New York Heart Association class 4 patients in it. And then what you can see is that our procedural complications in the COAP trial were much less than they were in the MITRE FR trial. And the residual 3 plus MITRE regurgitation out at, at 12 months was 17% in the MITRE FR trial compared to the 5% here. So much more uh, stringent uh, goal-directed medical therapy. So these patients in the MITRE FR uh, therapy, they had uh, heart failure meds at baseline and then there was variable adjustment, but there were heart failure physicians and a core lab, a maximally tolerated goal-directed medical therapies, few major changes during the follow-up. These patients were on intense therapy. As a matter of fact, I just referred a patient the other day for getting into the access registry for the COAP trial. And I got a call from the heart failure doc saying, hey, I want to try this or that or this. And I said, yeah, please. You know, we, we thought we did what we could, but please do what you can. And they're going to see about getting them into the real world registry for the COAP trial. So huge different picture, a huge story that's being played out right now. And these, these results were just published earlier this month. So a uh, 77-year-old um, man who we talked about, who's sick as heck, who's got a terrible uh, EF, he's got severe MR, and has, has really been feeling pretty terrible. So this is, this is uh, earlier this year before these data came out, but anecdotally we had good evidence to say that there was some hope for these patients. And so we decided to proceed with his procedure. So again, you can see I've come in with my device. We're coming down across the mitral valve. You can see this on, on fluoroscopy, what that looks like. Once we get across the mitral valve, we're really directing where the worst uh, part of the regurgitation is. And you can see I've put one clip here, but I still have pretty bad disease right here. And so here's what this looks like with one clip in. Well, shoot, why don't we go and put a second clip right in there? So this is uh, from my friends in Nashville at St. Thomas. They call this the St. Thomas Snuggle. So you get real close from your first clip to your second clip. You put those essentially right next to one another, and you get this as your result. You see a substantial reduction in the mitral regurgitation. And yeah, this valve looks a little bit funny afterwards, but guess what? This patient does really, really well. This is my favorite slide of all time. These are real time what happened to this patient. So these are his left atrial pressure measurements at the time of his procedure. So you can see his left, mean left atrial pressure is 32 at the, time of his pressure, at the time of his procedure, normal being about 18 or less. So you can see already this is terrible. Plus you can see these very high V waves telling you this is bad mitral regurgitation. So I put one clip in and now we're down to about 30 and the V waves have come down a little bit, but here's my second clip. 
put two clips in, I get my mean left atrial pressure down to 25, and my V waves have come down substantially. This patient went on to leave the hospital in two days. He went on to go to cardiac rehab and actually is still continuing to do very, very well as we speak and is very uh, uh, asymptomatic, not asymptomatic, but minimally symptomatic to the point where he's not been back in the hospital. He's been able to be completely managed as an outpatient and he's been taking trips, which is something he wouldn't have dreamed of doing before all this took place. So where are we right now? Well, we're improving the real world experience with this as evidenced by what happened in the COAP trial. If you look at the device related complications and the procedural outcomes in Everest as compared to COAPT, COAPT continues to improve. We continue to refine the procedure, the technique, the device is getting better. We're on to next generations of the device. We're seeing lower and lower procedural complications. We're seeing improved quality of life scores and decreased heart failure exacerbations leading to hospitalizations. Improvement in mortality, which we've never been able to show in secondary MR, is now at the forefront and we're very excited about this. Again, this is a heart team based approach. So we have an entire team of patients who surround themselves with these patients. And we have uh, our, at the forefront here, our coordinators, uh, Gigi Sims, who is our, our lead coordinator of the team, our nurse practitioner, which is Autumn uh, Bartonfield. I still need to change that, Autumn, I apologize. And then we have a number of, of proceduralists who are doing these cases from the interventional side. Uh, Dr. Mannion, who helps us with our Watchman cases from the electrophysiology side, and then sees these patients and helps us to decide, is that part of that medical therapy for that MR patient going to be a biventricular ICD? Dr. Pointer is our new cardiac surgeon here. Dr. Jahani has been very helpful in helping us to get all these patients through. And then we have a number of not only our CV anesthesiologists, but our imaging cardiologists who have helped us through. And we also have a number of our heart failure specialists who have really helped us, especially with these mitral valve patients who tend to be very sick and very complicated. And so with that, I thank you for your time and I'll take any questions. So that's a fantastic question. So the question is, when do we find out uh, about timing for this? When, when is enough enough? When do we take somebody who is on goal-directed medical therapy and put a clip in them? Or what I would even go so far as to say is, when do we do this at all? You know, you can, you can see that a number of patients who come into our clinics and they are sent with, with mitral regurgitation, I actually spend a fair amount of my time either doing some adjustment of heart failure medications or having Dr. Bailey or Mallory uh, Whaley, who's our nurse practitioner in the heart failure department, spend a lot of time uh, adjusting these medical therapies for these patients. So up titrating their beta blockers. We find that a lot of these patients with lower EFs are not on aldosterone antagonists. And, and I have uniformly started putting so many patients on spironolactone. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's a fantastic afterload reducer. It does a great job at, uh, at reducing the need for loop diuretic, which we see is an increased risk for hospitalizations. So there's a lot that we do on the medical therapy side to get to that point. And, and if you get to that point where, gee, as, as soon as I just add a little bit more spironolactone or I add a little bit more beta blocker, I'm worried I'm going to tip you over the edge or you come back a couple of weeks later, then that's when we do it. And a lot of it is this fine play back and forth where, okay, I'm going to try something today and I want you to come back in two weeks and I'm going to try something then I'm going to have you come back in two weeks. And it's this fine tuning that really if you're not making a lot of progress that I think that's where these patients lie. But what's interesting is that we'll see a number of these patients even in the hospital. They'll come in, they'll be sick, you don't know whether or not acutely something needs to happen to get them out of trouble. Um, and that's where we don't have evidence. I have done it. I have not been happy about doing it in the acute setting uh, because the outcomes are, are pretty miserable. These patients are going to have a very poor prognosis no matter what you do to them. So I think we're still learning that part of it. But as far as the outpatient, 
walkie-talkie kind of patient who's New York Heart Association class three or four. If they are on optimal medical therapy, they don't need a device, I think it's reasonable to go ahead and go forward at that time. No, you know, what's interesting about this device is that that polyester fabric that's on the outside of the clip actually induces endothelialization. And so what you have is that clip eventually just comp becomes completely incorporated into the valve. We don't tend to see any problems with uh, with hemolysis. Uh, we don't tend to see any long-term problems with the device itself. Uh, as far as, as, as you know, tearing um, uh, valve structures or anything like that, if that problem happens, that usually happens acutely. And we've learned that over time that, you know, if you've got a lot of calcium along the mitral uh, annulus, uh, along the, the ridge of the valve, and you pull too tightly, you could actually tear a hole in the mitral valve itself. And so we've learned over the years, you've got to be careful with that. That being said, one of the problems that we see with the device long term is if a patient goes on to develop severe residual regurgitation or, or has return of regurgitation, then going back in and doing something else becomes a little problematic. The surgeons, because you've induced all of this endothelial uh, formation on the clip itself and you've got now fibrosis onto the device and scarring of that device in place, the surgeons have a hard time cutting that out. And so that distorts the valve in ways that they would rather not have it distorted if they were to try to go back and do a repair. So from a repair standpoint on down the road, that gets to be a little problematic. And there have been talks about patients who have had this done as a bridge to getting something else done down the later. So for instance, they needed their regurgitation improved upon in the short term. They had something else going on. They needed a liver transplant. They needed kidney transplant, whatever the case may be. They got those things done, and then the plan was always to go back and, and, and do something surgically to that valve. Well, now that's a little bit of a problem. So surgery down the road is still something we're trying to contend with. One of the other interesting things that we find is as soon as you put a clip on and you narrow that orifice of the valve, you've now traded mitral regurgitation for mitral stenosis. So now you have to be very cognizant of this in terms of not only what is your stenosis, what is your gradient going into the procedure, but what is it going out? And so echo real time can tell you we can do Doppler imaging across that mitral valve and we can see what our gradients are at the time that we leave the procedure. Obviously we beta block the heck out of these patients and so they shouldn't raise their gradients too terribly much after the procedure is done. But if you leave the lab with more than four millimeters mercury gradient, those patients tend to have worse outcomes down the road. And one of the things that we very clearly pay attention to is that gradient as you're adding more clips. The most clips I've put in a patient is three clips. Thankfully, I was able to keep that gradient under three millimeters of mercury that whole time. But I've had instances where when I put that second clip on, all of a sudden, as I'm putting that second clip on, I see the left atrium just fill with what's called smoke which means you've stagnated all that blood flow in the left atrium. It's going to clot if you don't do something quickly. It's a bad idea, and then your gradients are really high across that mitral valve. And so that's where you have the luxury of this, of taking that off and knowing that if you leave that long term, that patient's going to do quite poorly. So we're very cognizant of what types of gradients the patients come into the lab with and leave the lab with. So we don't want to trade one problem for another. So a little bit of stenosis, a little bit of gradient, these patients are going to tolerate just fine. But once you get much above that four or five millimeters of mercury, it's, it's a different story. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Lou. So here's my question. Yeah. The aortic valve and the mitral valve are fairly close. Yes. What's the